And I also go by J Dog, J D A W G. But nowadays I'm J the Menace, J A Y D A M E N A C E. It's still all Menace, Black Menace. You know what it is. That's the deal. I'm not the hell for Black Menace. I'm your boy Threat, T H R E A T, better known as Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, M R E B A N E S I A. Scrooge, you heard me? Off the dump. Look. So if we want to talk about where you grew up, both of you, and uh, music in your household and kind of the first times of hearing music in your community, what that was like, whoever wants to start. Uh, see, we grew up in the same house. Right Pretty much, I mean, we grew up, we probably, um, we probably grew up maybe um, two doors down from each other. Right, really. You know what I'm saying? So we grew up, and like I said, pretty much in the same house, because if I wasn't in this house, it was at my house, or it was at somebody else that was kicking it with. I was, you know what I'm saying? So we were always pretty much together. But um, as far as the music, yeah, you know, when I can remember music from the 70s, like Stevie Wonder and all that kind of stuff when my husband was playing. You know, talking about, that was my first <clears throat> recollection of, of, of music that I could actually remember hearing. Was um, sneaking out the back door, told you not to go. It's like staying on my brain because, I mean, I, I remember back to the, to the spot where I was actually growing up at, and on, on Holly Grove Street, in the apartments, and little flats. And I used to always play in the backyard, and for whatever reason, when I was in the backyard, that song came on. You know what I'm talking about? It probably was more music than that too, though, but for some reason, that song was stuck in my mind. And I mean, yeah, that's what's up, though. I mean, a lot of old school music is based on what we grew up on. I like, you know, I, I mean, I like a lot of general music. I mean, it don't matter, but it's just, I mean, I like music for what it is, like, but at the same time, like, you know, my family was different. We was raised up on a lot of other stuff, too, like, so, church music and, you know, I ain't saying this topic right now, but... Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. But how to go raise that, you know, same spot, post HP 17 world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when's the first time that uh, you all thought about, um, you know, performing music, being a musician? When did that seem real to you? And then when did you all start working together? Well, we was doing gong shows at the time. Like, you know, that's when they didn't have all the, the, the well, it was a whole different market. Before the, even market, before the market even got started, we was like based on competition with each other, really. Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, <laughs> it came. Yeah, because I mean, work. at the end of the day, it's like we what we didn't come in the game. But well, we came in the game as a group, but we didn't come into music and, and, and rapping as a group. Right. He was his own enemy. That was my own enemy. We used to go at each other until one day they had, like I said, they, they started having gong shows, and we got in the gong show as just J Dog and Threat. Well, I wasn't even J Dog, because I was J and MC. I wasn't even the dog, and I was still an MC. You know what I'm talking about? But um. Like I said, we came in, you know what I'm saying, as different entities and we combined it to make Black Menace after uh, we started doing gong shows. Um, and, and we just came out and, and let's say we need to come up with a group name. And we threw names around and Black Menace was stuck. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how we felt we were at the time when we came up with that name. We were Black Menace, you know what I'm talking about? And, and it stuck. And um, like I said, from there, we, we took music um, serious when we saw the, the support from the public. You know what I'm saying? The feedback we got. Because we, all, we came in first place, and I ain't exactly We came in first place. We followed a guy by the name of Bobby Marchand. If you don't know Bobby Marchand, Google him. He was a legend in New Orleans music, and he was responsible for a lot of the artist's success in nice. New Orleans. And rest in peace, Bobby. Too. Right, rest in peace. But um, we went to all these different venues around the city where he hosted gong shows at, and we entered as J Dog and Threat, or J Dog and Threat. And we're in the first place, did the same beat, two shot. I ain't tripping, huh? Right. And we was the we, we had a song called "A Pimps of Poetry." I mean, it's lame now. Nah, I used to say it's lame now, nah, but back Fuck. then, shit, wasn't nobody touching it. And the show, we went against comedians and R and B singers and other rappers as well. You know what I'm saying? We got first place all the time. And um, from there, we decided to take it serious because it's like you know what I'm saying. We can really do this. Right. Quit our job, everything. Like, right. And we're full of flavor music. And around yeah. what year was this? How old were you guys? Um, shit, I was, um, we, was, we was teenagers. Eight, eight, eight. It was in um, 87, 88, 86, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88
And then um, tell us about the lead up to um, when you put out the first record, and then I want to talk about production of that for a little bit. Uh, the first record we put out was actually a record we did with um, some neighborhood um, homeboys we grew up with. We did um, a record called um, Holly Grove at 17 on Holly Grove Records, right. which was owned by Ephraim Payne and Roderick Smith. Right. That's how I owned it both of them. That's how I grew up them, you know what I'm saying? But um, mm-hmm. they put us out, they, they, they saw the support and they had the faith in us and they had money. <clears throat> Even Street Cat we talking about, they had money to finance projects back then, you know what I'm talking about? So they, they saw what we thought we had in us and they, they, they followed up and we went to the studio and, and did a record. I mean, we was doing singles back then. We weren't even doing full projects because that's what, was, what it was. You get a single paper radio, you was a small star to sit down and talk about right. and, and we got the record played on the radio and from there, you know what I'm saying, Black Minute started becoming a household name from that point. <clears throat> and then we decided to go and start doing bigger projects like EPs and EPs evolved into albums. Right. So from there, that point on, it was albums, albums, albums. What happened to Hollygrove Records, and at what point did you change to Deploy? Um, well, it was a, they, it became our project at one time became larger than we really expected at the time too, right? right. And they weren't able to; it wasn't feasible for what they was doing. So we, we as being our own men, we still had rights to do what we wanted to do. So we, yeah, it wasn't like, it wasn't like kicking them to the curb or nothing like that. I mean, right. and, and before Big Boy, we was actually. Um, we did a, a, a record deal with uh, Gary Ozenthal from Odyssey Records, the owner. Right. Gary was actually the one that put out Going Off and put on the best on the cassette. Right. <clears throat> that came out on, uh, that was after um, the little situation with Hollywood Grove Records. And even with that being said, I mean, there was never no love lost on, on that. And I mean, we, we still, to those dudes dying, they, we was the best of friends. You know what I'm talking about? They right. just understood the business of it too. It was like, I need to get with somebody bigger to bring you out to another level because we doing what we doing. And, it's cool what y'all are doing, but that ain't thing. So I mean, they kind of went down our way, and we was fortunate enough to keep ourselves together and, and, and keep it moving. And like I said, we, we did something with Gary Rose with all with Odyssey Records. We put out a single on us, um, and that caught the attention of Big Boy. You know what I'm saying? The, the single that we put out through Gary caught the attention of Big Boy. Um, Daz, and he was considered. A, he's listed. That was my question. He's listed on some um, spaces as production and producer for Ghetto Ass N Word, and others. Then it's Precise who's listed. So you can tell us about you know were the different versions of the record was the production <coughs> amongst everybody doing. No, nah, I mean when you when you see it like that, I'm sorry. Right. No, when you right. see it like that. It's like um, it, it's probably misprints on a lot of it because um, Jazz was our DJ, Precise was our producer. You know what I'm saying? So people that, that think they know the business on black men that speak about black men and they give people the wrong information. You know what I'm talking about? So that's probably a case of what happened. But I mean, Jazz was a DJ for us in shows. You know what I'm saying? He helped us when we rehearsed and, and did different things like that. But right. when it came out of production of it, it was precise. That's, that's what did the, the music on those projects. Mm-hmm. Um, you, so, you know, it's 92, 93, and you just put out this first big record. And there's, you know, there's lots of East Coast influences, lots of West Coast influences. But you also hear a lot of the start of New Orleans Bounce. How was all that coming together at the time? And, like, what were the hot clubs? What were the hot performers? You know, people you really looked up to at the time that you're putting out this first record? Really? To be honest, there was nobody else to look up to. I mean, we basically were setting a trend of our own, like, and we saw we saw something we saw something that was marketable at the time, like and it was like now you can see where it's lead where it's led up to. So I mean pretty much we I don't know about you but I mean we just, like we just kinda of viewed everybody else as competition for us. I mean we didn't look to um, people and that ain't even looking down on nobody. Right. I had a lot of respect for a lot of artists in the city, but at the same time I didn't look up to him per se as who I gotta do what he did or be like him. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? It's like, no, we got to blaze our own trail and show more right. people to get like us. And now, pretty much our thing, we, looked, we looked outside of the market for inspiration, people that was already, you know what I'm saying, doing their thing, you know what I'm talking about. And like I said, that's not shitting on nobody else that, that that's from the city that came up when we was doing it. I mean, but the admiration was there for, uh, from Bust Down and Tim Smooth Tim to Smooth. MC okay. Thick right. to um, <clears throat> Most Wanted Posse. <clears throat> Whoever was kind of doing their thing, you know what I'm saying, at the time, I mean, the respect was there. I mean, we did a lot of shows together with those cats. So, I mean, it was mutual respect, but at the same time, it's like, we got to be first. And that was our mentality. I really wasn't looking up to nobody at the same time. I wasn't shitting on nobody, but we just wanted to be first. Going back to Bobby Marchand, you talked a little bit about him, but um, I just want to go into that a bit more. And, um, you know, what happened after he was gone and, and what business model did he bring to things? How did he help people succeed in ways that other people hadn't? Bobby was um, 
Bobby was an instrumental. Very instrumental. Very instrumental in a lot of people's career, you know what I'm saying? I mean, from Cash Money to Big Boy to um, anybody who was really doing something at that time in place in the city, you know what I'm talking about? Because what Bobby did was Bobby was one of the first promoters to take New Orleans music and bring it outside, outside of New Orleans. Of Orleans right. And with that being said, what it did in turn has got the artists more exposure in, in, in a bigger way as opposed to just being a local artist. We were based local, but we were working outside of a local atmosphere. And that was, you know what I'm saying, tribute to Bobby Marchand. I mean, people that don't know Bobby Marchand, he was um, actually an artist himself. And he made a lot of big records. So, I mean, his influence and his connection still was what it was. You know what I'm saying? So, dealing with Bobby, that, I mean, it kept, kept a healthy relationship with him. <clears throat> kind of helped us get outside of New Orleans where people was kind of looking at us like, yo, these cats from New Orleans, because we wasn't doing bounce music. And bounce was kind of like prevalent from New Orleans at the time. We was doing like real street music. You know what I'm talking about? And it was like that wasn't that wasn't heard of from New Orleans people. So it was like we had to break through a lot of barriers because when people say New Orleans rappers, they expect to hear a certain kind of sound. But when they hear it, it's like that's not New Orleans, just that is New Orleans. But we just doing what we do. You know what I'm talking about? We're not following trends. We actually set them. Your records don't sound like anybody else's. And we were just talking about that. Um, you brought your own sound. Can you talk a little bit about what Precise brought and how he works with you guys? Maybe think of a record that you think was really great and, you know, both of you working together in a way that you wanted. I mean, Sice, yeah, Sice is our dude. Like, Sice, Sice grew up with us as well. Like, you know, his bass is like, he said when we were break dancing at the time, Sice was there too. Like, so mm-hmm. it's like, Sice, Basically, guy was he was a, he was a big instrumental part of what we was doing, like because Sykes knew he had a insight on what was going on before we knew what was going on too. Because in making the music, it had his own sound, like, and so in doing that, we had to have competition with the beat as well. Right, so right. that was pretty much made <clears throat> try to outdo the beat or whatever it comes to, right? So Sykes is phenomenal. As a, I would say, yeah, and he was before his time on production too. You know, right, about, like Sykes was making music back then that's still relevant, like right now. And this we talking about twenty years ago. You know, I'm talking about, um, and, and what he also what he brought Sykes brought a lot of direction to us too, though, because not only would he make the beat, he would actually be a Sykes a producer. He'd give you ideas on, on, on he don't just give you the beat. Right. He'd be like, I hear something like this here on it, or I hear if you, if you go like this here on it, the go like that. Like you know, what I'm talking about <clears throat> a lot of stuff that you hear black men is. From from then that we did was was Sykes' idea. We executed the plan, but it was his idea that we brought to light. Right. Like on the go off record, like one person rapping this speak, one person that speak. That was Sykes' idea. We wouldn't have thought of doing shit like that. You know what I'm saying? We just off the porch rapping, like yeah, let's rap. <clears throat> Sykes said, "I'm gonna put one in this speak, one in that speak." And but then we decided to write it. I mean, we wrote it to where every bar we said the same word, but in between that, it was like he told his own story, I told my own story. But the only thing that was on time was <clears throat> those rhyming words. And it was, it was phenomenal to me when I look back at it, like nobody never did that to this day. You know what I'm talking about? And it's ironic because like I said, that record there is kind of what made Black Men a household name. You know what I'm talking about? And I don't know if it was because of the, the record itself. It was a little party record before Bounce was Bounce. They had a few um, elements of a dance um, kind of vibe to it. But for the most part, I mean, like I said, um, Sykes was instrumental in a lot of um, Black Men of success. And other artists too, though, you know what I'm saying? Speaking on, yeah. speaking on us. Yeah, so we get plot to size. Mm-hmm. Um, around this time, what uh, what clubs were happening? Like, where would you hang out when you weren't performing? Where did you want to be? Where was everybody hanging out? So it was in the hood. Yeah, ghost town. Really ghost town. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I said, all the time we kind of ventured outside of that was to go do the thing with Bobby Marchand or somebody else was doing like gong shows, we performing somewhere, but we wasn't really like. No, let's go to the club kind of people. Nah, we just wanted to get that money. That's it. Yeah. Whatever that money was, that's what we was at. <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, to answer your question, I mean, we wasn't laying me. I mean, they had flirts, they had uh, whispers popping, they had uh, four nine, detail, discovery, yeah. rumors. You know, what I'm talking about. Yeah, we've been I mean, we did rumors time. probably uh, more than twenty times. You know, what but, I'm talking about. but at the same time, two year period to get going those spots. So basically, yeah. there wasn't no good marketing plan to hang in them. Yeah, right. Because why? So when we was in the city all the time, we've been on that game since back in the G. Why would somebody pay to come see you when they see you every week in the club anyway? You know what I'm talking about? So we kind of kept that to like, we need to, you want to see us, especially concerning the music, the pay, like, that's what we do. Right. Like he told you, we quit our jobs. We do music now. This is our social income. And we had to treat it as such. We had to treat it as a business. And you know what I'm saying? You get the results, you, you know what I'm saying? You get the results you're looking for. We treat it as such. 
going off, um, there's different versions of going off on um, the cassettes versus the vinyl. You know why that is? The, the different versions of the releases or what? No, it's, it's because the vinyl would add different versions on it for DJ purposes. I mean, DJs couldn't um, do mixing and stuff right. on the cassettes back then, and that's what we were dealing with. We needed cassettes of vinyl, so I mean, we did different versions on vinyl for DJ purposes. Like I said, what those privileges were, I don't know. You gotta ask Sykes. They're trying know. to make it accessible right. for everybody. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Put your hands I mean, on. He had reasons why, like I said, he did certain things. Like he said, he was a a, a, a genius at the music right. back then. You know what I'm saying? So his insight and knowledge of a lot of stuff was like, let's let Sykes do it. Let Sykes do it. You know what I'm talking about? And we always got good results out of it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, you guys have worked with everybody <clears throat> in the early years. You worked with Fiend, with Mystical, with Ghetto Twins, with G Slim. Mm -hmm. um, how how did everybody sound influence one another? Can you think of an example, or um, you know what uh, collab you think worked really well, or any numbers? All of them. I mean, I ain't showing up. We didn't feel like that. Right? We didn't. Nah, we didn't bullshit ourselves at all. And nobody wanted to be last. Right. So it basically, like like I said, it was still competition. Yeah, even though it was in-house. In-house, but in-house was, was like friendly no, competition. No, yeah. Nobody wanted to be last. Right. Nobody. And I, mean, I think that was like in all our projects, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, we, we, we got to outdo the last one that came out because we was doing numbers back then. And the whole thing about it is we wanted to evolve instead of digress. So every project that came after the, the, the last one, we wanted to sell more than now or now, right. just for you know what I'm saying to keep it as opposed to boom being stagnant. Or, you know what I'm talking about, and it, it was working. You know what I'm talking about, and I mean the formula for it was we kept a lot of artists around. It wasn't just you know what I'm saying people that could do music. It was actually artists that could make me better, make right. him better. We made them better. You know what I'm saying. Even doing collabs. You know what I'm saying. Like the song we did with Mystical, which was big for us because that catapulted our drama time album to selling over um, two hundred thousand um, independent copies. And that, that's unheard of back then, but I mean, at the time, well, that, that's what we was doing numbers like that. And we attribute, you know what I'm saying, the, the help of that because we got national exposure on the boot camp video. And a lot of people started quiet about Black Menace. And when they look us up, or well, they got an album out, it made people buy it. And we actually sold more records um, away from the city than we did in the city. You know what I'm talking about? And that's, you know, especially interesting because if you think about, you know, what that took for people, you know, if people bought a record, they had to leave their house, they had to go somewhere, they physically buy it as opposed right. to now where you can like literally just you know, get on your computer and click right. something, you know, right. so it's all the more impressive that that many people you got motivated to actually right. do that. Right, know? right, um, Your favorite show, can you think of mm -hmm. your favorite show? I know it might be of all time, maybe just in like a certain era or something. Oh, um, me personally, I think the House of Blues shows we had a lot of times that we did the House of Blues was like the rafters shaking. Yeah, <laughs> that that was energetic wise. I feel what he had with it, but my most memorable show for obvious reasons is a show that me and him and Mystical opened up for Run DMC in St. Louis. Oh, that, that was I was flowed by that, you know what I'm saying? We was we opened up for Run DMC, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. We did the boot camp song, you know what I'm saying? We got to perform on our own songs. Mystical did his show, and then Run DMC came out. No more acts. What year? Um, let's say 96, between 95 and 96, we had just dropped the project. So yeah, it's right there, right there, right there, 95. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the name of the venue or none of that, but I mean, so. It was in Jackson. I don't remember where it was. It was Jackson? Yeah. See, I'm saying the wrong city there. It was in Jackson. Oh, man. What was it? But yeah, we opened up a run damn scene in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was for me most memorable for that reason, though, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, like I said, without the work them dudes put in back then, it, 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 it wouldn't um, probably been as easy for groups, per se. That's why it meant so much to me, because they was a group and we was a group. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that that kind of where jazz came in that because they had Jam Master G. You feel what I'm saying? So to idolize somebody coming up and then actually get a chance to perform for the same people that came to see those people, um, humbling. Never forget it. It's been, what, 30 years? More than 30 years you guys have been in this business. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> 20. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been a few, it's been a while that you all have been yeah. in this business and you've seen everybody come and go and you're still, you know, you're still viable and you're still making music and stuff. Um, can you think of, you know, your longevity? Why do you think that, you know, you've been able to sustain over this amount of time, whereas other people have gone different ways? Or why do you think you're still loved in the city? 
I think um, the love comes from the body of work that we just put in, and, and um, people that, that that came behind us, kind of pay homage. And I mean, that's humbling in itself to see so many people say, "Man, I thank you for what you did," and just to give us the praise. You know, talking about for for, for laying the um, groundwork for what was coming now. You know what I'm saying? Some people look over it, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I don't have a problem with that because, I mean, it's, it's a microwave society right now. There's just so much going on to, I ain't worrying about that old shit, but at the same time, about that old shit, the new shit will be able to stand. You know what I'm talking about? So, um, it, it, it's, um, it's a respect level too, as well. Yeah. It, it, they, I think people respect us more than anything. We stay true to what we do. And, you know, I think that respect go a long way. And so, yeah, it goes along with it. And saying that, it's like a lot of people just, you know what I mean? They give us that. It's like an honor just to be still amongst them, too, like. Right. right. So, and, and, and still be relevant, too. Relevant, you know, that's that's right. Because I ain't you know, blowing my arm, but I mean, if they ain't coming with it, then I mean, we'll, we'll run over a lot of motherfuckers out here right now. You know what I'm talking about? But We're still trying to get this money here. Yeah. The the, 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 um, the longevity that <laughs> comes from recruiting the, the passion. You know I'm saying we, we never lost the passion for music, and I think um, people go through stuff sometimes in life that that kind of divert their attention or their love for something somewhere else. And I mean, I'm just thankful that we was always able to keep music as a foundation for us to um, keep it moving and, and, and usher a new generation behind us too, as opposed to just being selfish like it's about us. At the end of the day, it's not music gonna live forever. You know, I'm telling money. We would we want to be responsible for. The next generation of music that come behind us because I mean we set a certain precedent when we came out and did our thing and I won't leave on that same note, you know what I'm saying, doing the same thing that we started. And that's you know what I'm saying, kinda of giving New Orleans a reputable um sound of music when they come out, you know what I'm saying? People can respect it for what it is and that's music. It ain't no um it's bounce or it's this no it's music. You know what I'm talking about? And I mean I just wanna um, kinda of leave on that same note that we came in on and that's being trendsetters. We're not we're not following nobody, not trying to be nobody else. Um and as, as long as God give us the breath and the strength right. and the desire to do it, then, I mean, this is what we're going to be doing, this music. Like I say, um, we can transition from one side of it to the other. We still do the artistry and thing too, though, but I mean, we're on the other side of the business too now. You know what I'm saying? And every day, that's that's learning. You know what I'm saying? Every day is learning on that side. Because it's new that we was always the artist for the label took care of the business. Now it's like, oh, no, we the label and we the artist. So, you know what I'm saying? we got to put on a few different hats. And like I say, every day, it's, we, we kind of learning curves, but... We welcome it, we embrace it, because at the end of the day, all it's doing is making us prepare for what we're about to do with this thing called It's International, and that's, you know what I'm saying, be like a, a foundation of, of New Orleans, like a cornerstone of New Orleans music. So tell us about Hits International. How did that all come about, and then what work are you doing now? Um, Hits started uh, in about three years ago. Three years ago, we started Hits, and um, that was Black Men and Supporters in Crime. Um, we had a situation at a club called a venue, you know what I'm saying, with, with a, um, a leg or whatever. And um, it didn't work for um, unspecified reasons, you know what I'm saying, I'd rather not even get into that, but that didn't work. <clears throat> so with that being said, though, um, we kind of came together as men and, 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 and business people and, and said we need to do something to sustain what we started, you know what I'm saying, started. And that brought about hits international, you know what I'm saying, we came together, we need to come up with a name, we came with the name. Um, Got everything straight with the state and the government, you know what I'm saying? So we're official company, you know what I'm talking about? And um, we just started putting it together from there. Like I said, we didn't have no artists on the label at first, but black men is a part of the crime. But through um, us knowing what we're going with it and what we need, and we need youth, you understand? We can't do this forever. Right. We ain't fooling ourselves, nigga, we can. So, you know what I'm saying? We opened the doors to different people that came through. And I mean, some some things stayed, some things didn't, you know what I'm talking about? And, um, we just decided, um, as far as hits international, go that everything that comes through here has to be quality. It has to be marketable. It has to be the whole package. We can't just accept anything because, I mean, like I said, at the end of the day, whatever you put in is what you get out. And I don't want to put out half ass shit. Um, how would you describe how New Orleans hip hop is different from other places in the South? New Orleans hip hop is different. I mean, we or you might not like, because I don't think it's so much different because um, we basically setting the trend about them now. Like, we we basically like leading the way per se. Before it was like New York was on top doing what was you know everybody got a chance East Coast West Coast. Now you see what's really going on is all South and what have you. But 
I think they're following us right now, like, listening to what's going on in the industry right now. So everybody getting on the South shit. So we embrace that too. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it is what it is. And, and the downside to, 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 to the thing too, though, I think the difference between New Orleans music and other people's music is you see more camaraderie outside of here. I mean, down here you got a lot of cliques that click up and it's like, if you ain't with us, then we ain't fucking with you or vice versa, you know what I'm saying? You fuck with them, I don't fuck with you for that reason. But when you're outside of here, you see a lot of people that get money because they come together and they pool their resources together and make a bigger impact on people outside of their market. So when you go there, you gonna hear somebody out of that little circle of people that's dealing with each other, you know what I'm saying? Because if they're that strong, there's that many more people that's promoting the same cause. And I think down here, you know what I'm saying, everybody, you know what I'm saying, want to be the next one to get out of here. So it's like, fuck what you're doing, fuck what you're doing, I'm trying to get out of here. As opposed to, man, let's come together and we ain't got to leave out of here. We can stay here and hold it down and make people come to us. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, in, 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 in large part, that's what us at HITS, you know what I'm saying, aiming to do is to kind of make, like I say, New Orleans, uh, 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 recognizable for music outside of jazz, you know what I'm saying? Because jazz gets a lot of recognition. When you talk about New Orleans music, the first thing that come up is jazz. And it's, it's bigger than jazz, even though jazz is the foundation of a lot of music, but we got a strong hip hop community in New Orleans, but it's just divided. And I think that's the difference in our music and, and, and our movement as opposed to people outside of here, you know what I'm saying? You in New York, they got a lot of people that's doing, you know what I'm saying? They're networking with each other. And, they, and, they, and through the networking is what it's pretty committed. I mean, I understand that. And, like I said, I think they got people that want to do it, but they just got to be somebody that started. And once they start moving, I think more people will gravitate towards it. And that's what we're trying to do is get start that, you know what I'm talking about? There doesn't seem to be much support in the city for hip-hop. There aren't that many venues that program hip-hop anymore. Right, right. So how has that changed over the years? I mean, it seems like, you know, at this point with all the gong shows and we're going on and whatever, it seems, ironically, like there are actually more venues doing that than now. But, I mean, that's just my impression. How was it? How was it then? In terms of like, how has it changed over time? I mean, it's, it's like you said, the evolution is, is almost right. phasing it out of the nightclub for its performances, you know what I'm talking about? Because I mean, we used to do gigs like probably three or four times a week because every night they had somewhere to go do a gig at, but it's like, you got to pick certain nights now. On Saturday, this popping, you, know, you got to go here on this day. And they like that, and we built the stage and you know, everything. Like, it's not back to normal, so. It's, but the good side of it is like a lot of artists get to go outside of this mall, you know, and then still explore the town as well as just staying here and trying to make it work for what it is. Outside is still better. More people to reach. Um, music in Hollygrove, do you think it's any different from other places? Any other world, any other community? I mean, you know, just look at the people that came out of Hollygrove. I'm talking about, I mean, everybody was hard hitters from Wayne to Fiend to Skip to Black Menace to uh, Mina from Part of the Crowd, the insane. I mean, and it's a, it's a list that go on. Nesby Phipps, um, Congo, you know, talking about Recon, you know, talking about it, the list go on. I mean, everybody I name is, is like reputable artists, you know what I'm saying? And when I say artists, that's people that take the pen game serious. They can actually write and do music. And they're just like, yo, I'm on the block and I'm, no, fuck all that shit. Tell, tell me something, tell me something, take me somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? And I substance. mean substance and content. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody I named was those kind of rappers, and I think that's what kind of um, get, give us an edge in that sense, you know what I'm saying? Because they got talent all over the city, but people that kind of made it out and made names for themselves come from that general area. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I don't know what it is. It might be something in the water or we close to Hell Iron Highway or something. I don't know what it is, but you know what I'm saying? Just like people that, um, that have popped off and made a name outside of um, the city was people from that general area. And that's where we at. That's us. Colin? A couple of I don't want to. I'm going to ask you. What if we not talked about that you want to talk about? Um, I can't elaborate a little bit more on what we got planned, uh, what we're about to do. Uh, we didn't talk about that, what we had now. Um, we actually um, have music done already, like for us project wise. Um, Greg got a solo project he got done called Past, Present, and Future. And like he is, his moniker is Ebenezer Scrooge. He did so, but he talking about music in the music sense. Past, Present, and Future. And that's that's what we are, you know what I'm saying? We're the Past, Present, and Future. I have a project I'm working on called Flipping the Script. Well, not working on but it's done called okay. Flipping the Script. And we also have a project together okay. called OG Music that we're going to release uh, the first quarter of next year. But the, um, 
the two mixtapes are going to be released um, within a matter of the next couple of months. Before um, the get out, those two mixtapes are going to be released. You people kind of prequel to the album. So my, and he on my project, I'm on his project, but we have a project together called OG Music. We're also releasing um, J. Jones October 20th. We got Smash Jones. Brothers um, releasing um, December 12, 12, 12. Uh, we got an R&B cat that's sensational by the name of Sty. It's an acronym, but stay true to yourself. Um, Black Burner Blaze, if y'all don't know Black Burner Blaze, Black Burner was with the Black Burner. They had the number one song in the city for like eight months. The um, song with Magnolia Chop. Um, to my lady, he's come on and worked that night. He working on a solo project. He's still a group, but he working on a solo project under hits. Uh, we got Boss Man. Um, Superior. Boss Man Superior. We got um, Gator. Um, we just uh, made a line with Militia Gang out of New York. It's Corey Guns and Peter Guns. We actually going to put out a project on one of the artists that's from New Orleans. We signed with um, Militia Gang. And that's um, his name, Cool, Militia Cool. Somebody wanted to be rude. Right? <laughs> Don't open that door. Close the door. Can you. Uh, were you done? Do you want to finish your, your thought? Um, I'm done. Can you name, uh, do you have a personal favorite of your records? Just you think history wise? No, of, of your own records, do you have a personal favorite or can you not pick one? It's hard to pick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like a lot of his songs too, but you know, so mm -hmm. I mean, right. I mean, just to make it too, we fans each other too. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we we're not just partners in, in, in rhyme with that. We fans each other. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, different records mean different things to me. So I can't say I got a favorite record. You know what I'm talking about? Because it depends on how I feel. Or how most like change. Right. Like so, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every song got a different substance to it. That's it. Unless you guys have anything else. What'd you say, B? <laughs> <laughs> See, that was a ground. I like that. What? Any, any, anything I, I like think, man, no, you got, I, my, most of my questions are actually going to be about Sykes, you know? Yeah. His yeah. range was incredible, man. But y'all talked about that. He went yeah. everywhere from like the best bouncer, like the best. <laughs> actually, you know, maybe there was something popping in my head. Actually, if you had to talk to me in like 95, and you told me like who's gonna make it, like the biggest out of here, I would pick y'all over cash money, you know, hands down. Up oh, top. But understand this much too. Hands down. Like, understand this much. Everybody. <laughs> we um we we, we was um off of a lot of situations right, at the right. time as an independent we was making a lot of money, bro. And we just felt like, you know what I'm saying, why even stop what we doing to go get with this thing? Y'all ain't offering we wanted not saying we wouldn't have did it, but they weren't offering enough money for us to do it as a whole. You know what I'm talking about? They took Mystical and got some money for Mystical. They was trying to do a whole thing, but it wasn't enough. And at the time, like I said, as an independent, we was selling records. You know what I'm saying? What we was in on the paperwork side. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? We were getting our money. We were getting our money then, you know what I'm talking about? So we wasn't just selling for anything. So, I mean, that's. It probably would have helped us as far as our. Uh, uh, Looking back, wow. yeah, in hindsight, every day twenty twenty in hindsight. So if we look back on it, it would have been feasible so, to take I mean, that just to bring side. that to that level and bring what we had and make it bigger. But you know what I'm saying? We was like, like I said, um, coming from from nothing as far as music wise to making, you know, what I'm saying money, getting raw the checks and doing shows. And every time right. you go out your house to do anything, you get money for it. You just feel like I'm on my now end. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, what are they talking about? We fuck with them people, man. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's good, though. I mean, like I said, um, man, I would, like I said, our respect level was bigger than that, too. Like, we, I mean, we fuck with everybody, for real. Mm -hmm. And they probably still fuck with us right now. Even if we see them today, it's, it wouldn't be no, like, they don't know us or whatever. Right, right. It's a respect level, too. And you get what you get. We always get right. respect, you know what I'm saying? We respect men as men, and we play boys like they boys, you know what I'm talking about? Not meaning age-wise, you know what I'm talking about? And I mean, we, you get what you get, and we understood that from, from teenagers to being men now, you know what I'm talking about? So, I mean, that's why I think, attributed back to what you said about the <clears throat> longevity of it. If people don't respect you, you know what I'm saying, they'll shit on you. They'll run you out of the game, but yeah, they we get embraced, you know what I'm talking about? We get embraced everywhere we go and every time we do something because I mean our quality never changed. We well, always we stay relevant because our music always meant something. You know what I'm saying? We pride ourselves on doing the kind of songs that can be lasting. Like you can do a song now and it can still have the same feeling five years from now to somebody who never heard it. Mm -hmm. 
And they do. And, you know, take, you know, your writer from 1992, it sounds a lot more current, a lot more modern than a lot of the other ones from 92. Right. Really, right. right. What was yeah. the first time you heard yourselves on the radio? Man, when? <laughs> yeah. When, and if you can remember, like, did it stick out of your mind? Do you remember what that felt like to hear yourself? Uh, David, you know, David, 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 boy, David, 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 Sure. I don't even know where I was at. It was like it was a seven. It was seven o'clock. I know that fucking um. What, what you call it? Um, what was the name of the show? Um, Make it a break or something like that. Make it a break. And the call that came behind that was like, "Yo, who was that? Yo, play that song again." It's like, "Yo, that's us, boy. Do that shit." Right. And from there, you know what I'm saying? He started playing the record in his rotation on uh, on the weekends and throughout the week. And that, I mean, the record was it, it was like a, a catapult for, like I say, black men to be who we are right now. Even though we didn't make too many songs like that after that, you know what I'm talking about? Right. I mean, that was kind of like a springboard for us to get up and y'all know us now, but well, this is what we got to offer. You know what I'm talking about? What was David D's influence in the city? Huge. And yeah. David D was like, I mean, New Orleans is not a big old city, you know what I'm talking about? So we didn't have like a lot of different radio stations. So I mean, Q93 always was the one. They was, they was the one. And, and as far as uh, radio personality, he was that dude. Yeah, he was you know a radio person. And as far back as I mean, even far back as I can remember, I don't remember even nobody else that was working on the radio at that time, name wise. So I could be like, oh yeah, they had him in the morning, and they were such as David D. David D. That's all I remember. You know what I'm talking about? So I mean, his influence was like that big. David D. broke records. He actually played records that he gave me a shot. If you liked the record, he played it. Now, if people liked it, he played it again. I ain't like that. You know what I'm talking about. And that's what prompted us to start our own radio station. We got an online radio station we were talking about. It's intradio.com. Uh -huh. We also have an online store where you can go purchase drama time and all the old music from black men and part of the crime, as well as the new music from the upcoming artists, as well as the new shit on us, you did all that shit in one spot, man. And it's hitzint.com, you know? When did that when did that start? How did that come about? Um like I said, we had a problem with um local radio. Right. And uh, we still, politics, yeah, the sure. politics of the local radio, we, have, we have actually had a problem with it. We had meetings with um, certain people, sat down and proposed to change, and they didn't, you know what I'm talking about? We gave up, you know what I'm saying, some 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 things, and it just didn't materialize until we, we wanted it to be. So we just said, we're going to start a, a, a way for independent artists to still get heard without having to go through the BS that, you know what I'm saying, you got to go through to get your record played on the radio where they should support it. That's another thing about New Orleans music. Too, though. You go to other places, you hear local music on the radio. You don't yeah. hear that down here. You don't hear top 40 shit. You know what I'm saying? People, stuff that's already made, that's what they're going to play. But out in other spots, they give those artists a chance. And they plan to let the public decide once they hear it without the red tape. And that's what crushes a lot of people dream because they don't ever get nowhere. They got a good record. Right. They never get it played. That's why I say it's good for the market to be outside the market right now. If you could get there. And yeah, our, 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 our contribution to giving back to that is we don't give them an outlet to get out there. All you got to do is, you know, so anybody within in, in the world that have internet to log on and listen to the, the radio. You know what I'm talking about? It's just on us to get a promotion and, and get it out there to the people to tune in and listen to it. We've been doing a good job since we started it. You know what I'm talking about? And so, I mean, that's not just for um, New Orleans artists, period. We do that for everybody who, who's independent that, that want to um, get their record heard. If it's quality music that I feel like uh, uh, work, or uh, it's all good to us on this end, we'll play it. You know? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, New Orleans musicians become world famous and without the benefit of help from local radio, right. you know, from the right. city, from anything. I mean, if anything, you know, some like to try to actually... That's why I cheer on. Um, when somebody make it out of here because I know what needs it for them to do it. Right. So that's why I, I, you'll never see me, oh, how you get a deal? How does that happen? No, I applaud that because that's somebody right. else that made it out through all of the boys. I know, I know what they went through because I went through it, still go through it. So for them to get through those little, however way they got it, I, I, I don't keep question it. You know what I'm saying? Just keep right. doing it. Keep and I applaud it. it. It's a big, I, I, stand, I stand up and clap for it. Frank Ocean, you know what I'm saying? Signing with, um, um, not the kids I'm with 50 you know what I'm talking about and Courtney Hart with, with her situation and, you know what I'm saying well but you know what I'm saying get up out of here and, and do what I know what you had to go through to get it so my, my salute. yeah salute it's, it's big I, I appreciate and I applaud that and I look for more of it to happen but I just want us to be a, a catalyst as far as producing a situation that can help more people get on and pursue their dream and not have that talent and let it go to waste because I mean nobody's really nurturing and, and helping, you know what I'm saying, support that. 